is Ron Simon from Scripps Clinic, and those of you who know him or have been to his talks before know he's uh, a very valuable, very good educator, also a, a nice, funny guy. We're not quite sure whether we're going to have a second hour with the professor's rounds or not. We'll let you know uh, before the session starts. And I won't be here next week, unfortunately. I have to go to Hawaii. Oh, <laughs> oh. And I was thinking about calling in, but it'll be four in the morning in Honolulu, so I'm not too certain about that. So Drew will probably run the session. We'll record it for you. How you record it, all right. Anybody uh, else got an announcement, anything in the community that we need to discuss? If Drew, you, no? Okay. Otherwise, uh, Kevin's got uh, what I think is a fascinating topic. This is certainly hot stuff in the scientific world. Microbiome and microbial products in early life development of asthma and allergies. Oh, and those from the outside for CME credit, I'm pretty sure the word of the week is gold. Gold. Right, thanks, Lyle. All right, well, thanks for getting up to hear about microbes. Uh, this is our mandatory slide. Disclaimers, I don't have any uh, conflicts to disclose. So this morning I wanted to talk about um, some definitions first. Microbiome, microbial products. Uh, you've all heard about the hygiene hypothesis. We'll talk about that. Um, I want to go over some innate immune mechanisms too. And, you know, with the hygiene hypothesis, there's been a lot of observational studies in the past several years. And I picked just a few that are representative, looking at asthma, food allergy, eczema. And then really I wanted to focus more on a couple of prospective studies in the past couple years that I think take this idea to the next level. And um, so let's define microbiome. Um, this is actually a Wikipedia definition, and I wanted to pick something that's kind of a general, use all uh, definition. So it's the totality of microbes, their genetic elements or genomes, and environmental interactions in a particular environment. Now keep in mind that these commensal organisms are actually critical to human survival. Um, so for example, vitamin K production. Uh, we need uh, microbes in our gut to help produce vitamin K. And with that sort of symbiotic relationship, there's this discussion about are we a super organism? Are we human and all of the microbes that make up our bodies? And if that's true, then maybe their genomes are also part of our genome. So those genes required, for example, to make vitamin K are almost part of our genome, but outside of our bodies. Uh, there's 10 times as many cells in that microbiome in our bodies, uh, which is surprising because we count those 100 trillion cells. This is one estimate I saw, but maybe it's only 200 grams, and that's not very much. But I guess they're little tiny guys, and so that might account for it. Now, the first estimate was that there's about 100 times as many genes in this microbiome genome, all those uh, uh, bugs inside of us. It's a lot of genes. So if you look at the skin, this is one way of starting to break down a biome. So if you look at the surface of the skin, culture it, you're going to get these sort of variations. And if you map it out, um, if you look up here in the uh, head and face, most of these blue and, and aqua-colored uh, microbes are the actinobacteria. As you work your way down the extremity into the arm, for example, you get more into the uh, bacteroides and proteobacteria. Uh, the protobacteria being those with uh, gram-negative uh, surfaces, flagella, that sort of thing. And then as you get into the lower extremity, uh, you get more into the uh, staph, so the gram-positives. And these are just some observations that are made about just the surface of the skin. 
What about the microbiome of the lung? Uh, so if you look at the lower respiratory tract, it's, it's replete with bacteria, yeast, uh, all kinds of organisms. And if you look at each uh, square inch of surface area, I'm sorry, square centimeter surface area, you've got as many as 2,000 genomes just in that tiny piece of land. Um, if you look at the, the different genera, there's probably nine major groups comprising both aerobes and anaerobes. Um, keep in mind, too, that there's also uh, harmful or potentially harmful bacteria in there, too. So you've got strep pneumo, um, H influenza, and MCAT. So when you look at more of the uh, disordered lung problems like COPD, you get this uh, change, more or less, in the microbiome in the lung. So you've got chronic mycoplasma, uh, pseudomonas, staph, and then I found this interesting. In asthmatic children, there's a predominance of these proteobacteria, these gram-negative flagellated um, endotoxin-producing bacteria. And then, as we know, in the cystic fibrosis lung, you're seeing more pseudomonas, staph. And I learned it's Burkholder as a patient, but it's got a new name. Um, and there's also a correlation here with CGD, not necessarily in the lung, but these catalyzed positive organisms are seen in that disorder. One of the jobs of the lung, though, in this microbiome is to define you know, the inside and the outside world. And so you have these uh, epithelial cells that their job is to recognize the good and the bad and hopefully be able to distinguish accurately between them. So one way is using uh, receptors, so like a, a toll-like receptor or a knob receptor. And in the case of, say, lactobacillus, uh, this is a friendly organism in general. And <clears throat> when it encounters these receptors, you're going to have a pretty energic response. And so in this example, uh, it's going to produce IL-10, which is a pretty you know, mild uh, reaction to these guys. And then these weak signals uh, upregulate T reg cells and other more, uh, I should say, neutral uh, responses. Now, if you've got a, a pathogen like strep pneumo or pseudomonas, you're probably going to encounter a TOLARC receptor and use a pro, pro inflammatory pathway. And so here you've got um, this transduct, transduction pathway down to NF kappa B, where you get the uh, elaboration through the nucleus of these pro inflammatory cytokines that then upregulate dendritic cells, neutrophils, macrophages, these, these actor cells that go up and then destroy potentially uh, the guys that trigger them in the first place. Now, the, okay, how, how far down, I don't usually think of the lung throughout the whole lung as having bacteria. Do, do we all the way down to uh, alveoli or how, how far down? I didn't, I didn't read how far they go down, but I can only speculate that as far as they can reach. And one could argue that to get down to, like, say, an alveolus might be even easier because we've got more cells and a closer proximity, but I can only speculate. So the NIH is working on a human microbiome project, and this is uh, an interesting uh, project where they're working on sampling of uh, healthy adults. They're looking in the, uh, the nasal cavity, oral cavity, skin, GI, and then uh, your genital tracts. And they already have a lot of samples from healthy volunteers. And the whole idea is to characterize you know, what, kind of, what kind of organisms are on our bodies and where are they and how do they change. Um, <clears throat> they also want to create these uh, reference uh, genomes. So in other words, sequence and categorize all these bugs and, and make them available for people online. Um, to put it in perspective, you know, I was uh, out of college for a couple of years. I worked in a gene sequencing center for the UW. And what took us maybe a year in the old-fashioned you know, polycholamide gel and Sanger sequencing uh, now might take days, maybe a week, to do with the automated process. And so it's much easier to get into these genes, genomes and find out what's going on. Yeah. When you say normal or healthy volunteers, does that count how many courses of antibiotics these people have had before you get them as a normal volunteer? I'm not sure they really accounted for that. I mean, that'd be... Because it would be sort of rare to find a, a normal adult who's never had a course of antibiotics before. Right, right. I don't think I have. Maybe. No, I know I got prophylax for uh, protests one time, <laughs> thanks to pediatrics. If the goal of this project um, is that they want to characterize how many millions of bacteria live on us, just in general, because there's some, a lot, that don't actually culture out. So they're using the gene analysis, it's really cool. And one could argue that it's quote-unquote normal to have had it's antibiotics, as many of us probably have, so... Mm -hmm. Anyway, but in order to do these genome sequences, it takes a lot of computational power, and these are things we didn't have 10 and 15 years ago. Um, so that's really a leg up. So some of the things they found so far, uh, looking at these different DNA patterns, uh, they can go online. I drew out this little link. But if you go online, there's actually a repository already with a lot of genomic and proteomic, and proteomic information. Here we go. I think you can see it on the outside. I'm bringing up uh, 
an Explorer window. That's not coming out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you going to come? Well, I'll skip this part. I'll just tell you now that there are hundreds of microbes that are listed on this uh, website and through the NIH, and you can actually go in there and buy organism and learn about it. So if you wanted to research a particular bug, you go in and then you uh, click on it. So in this project now, we've got over 10,000 different species in our organism, uh, our superorganism. And the researchers think they've found the majority of the, the genera that are there. Whereas before, it might have been 100 times as many genes in this microbiome genome. Now they're thinking it may be closer to 360 times as many genes. Um, now, there's this idea of a, of a gut enterotype. So when you characterize all, let's say you took all of us in the room here, um, and you looked at the predominance of bacteria, these research, researchers think there's probably three different main types uh, characterized by the large preponderance of Bacteroides, Prevotella, or Ruminococcus. And the idea is that there's a lot of variation between individuals, families, communities, and we're not quite sure why, and it doesn't really fit strictly into these three groups, but that's one way of, of dividing it up. But like uh, Paul was saying, that you, know, you get a change in these microbiomes with disease state, uh, with a state of health. And interestingly, they're already seeing that when there are these shifts, they get back to a new equi equilibrium after the person kind of gets back to that basic state of health. And it may not be the same from where they departed. So an example of, let's say, lactobacillus, you know, probi probiotics, there may be one enterotype where that's favorable, but not for another. So it's hard to say exactly where this will fall out. But I think you'll hear enterotype a lot here in the near future, or in the future. <clears throat> so microbial products, that's another part of our discussion today. So uh, two main categories, structural and maybe cytoplasmic. So really key structural components, cell wall, mannins, uh, flagella, these will trigger the immune system. And in the cytoplasmic uh, compartment, you've got endotoxin like LPS, and then these unmethylated CPG DNA sequences are real important. Uh, we'll talk about it in a second. How does the body detect these? So you've got toll receptors, uh, you've got C3B, which is an option, and that'll help sort of identify an example of gram positive bacteria, the uh, cell wall. Excuse me. And then the lectin pathway, which is in the complement cascade, will attach just to the mannose residues on particular bacteria. And this is a non um, Ig binding form of, of complement fixation. So you have all these sort of areas ready and willing to attack if there are these um, uh, microbial products that show up on the scene. And in this diagram here, you've got the CPG, these oligo oligodeoxynucleotides. And the C and the G, basically, the, the cytosine and guanine residues that are kind of compact, that they're all sort of stacked together. And for some reason, that is a motif that is more common in um, bacteria. And the immune system actually keys into this and says, we've got a, an invader here, so act. And in this example, um, what happens is these CPG motifs, when they're uh, chopped up, they get uh, endocytosed, <coughs> and then these toll receptors are actually inside the endosome, and they detect these and through a signal cascade, uh, send this N of kappa B into the, uh, uh, the nucleus, and you get elaboration of these pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. So again, the whole idea is to have these microbial products that trigger parts of the innate immune system and then signal um, or create production of these uh, cytokines. <coughs> I'll spend a few minutes talking about <coughs> toll like receptors. And then generally, you've got two major classes. You have those that are on the plasma membrane and then those on the uh, endosomal membrane. <coughs> when you look at toll like receptors one and two, they look at bacterial cell wall in general. Uh, number four looks at LPS, or these gram-negative <coughs> uh, uh, microbial products. Killer five is uh, notable for detecting fl uh, flagellin. And when I think about the uh, plasma membrane versus the endosomal uh, toll receptors, the ones on the plasma membrane have to detect things right outside of the cell. So really in that aqueous phase surrounding them, you know, do you have other bacteria swimming around? Do you have uh, broken parts of bacteria? And so, or even endotoxins like LPS. And so on the outside surface, you can get LPS through four and then flagellum or you know, parts of the uh, bacterial tail in uh, TLR5. All these, again, these are signal transduction molecules, so these, uh, these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PAMPs, get picked up on the toll receptor, and the signal gets sent into the nucleus. This is a um, diagram of the endosomal uh, toll receptors. Over here on the right, this endosome has TLR3, 
Uh, TLR3 is actually notable because it uh, detects viral double-stranded RNA. So if you can imagine, in the uh, immune response, you have endocytosis and processing of these microbes. They're all chopped up and you know, loaded up on MHC. That's the adaptive response. There's still an adaptive or an immune, sorry. That's the adaptive response. This is still an innate form where you've got uh, these toilet receptors within the cell, in the cytoplasm, in the endosome, that will make the signal cascade. TLR3 is a bit unique in that it doesn't use this thing called MITE88. This is a signal uh, cascade protein. And the vast majority is other TLR receptors. But TLR3 uses something called TRIF and then joins the process here at TRAF6 to NEMO, then F kappa B to the nucleus. Um, <clears throat> so you'll see sometimes the, the definition of uh, MITE88 or non MITE88 pathways. And TLR3 is notable for not being MITE88. Also, uh, because HSV is a double-stranded RNA virus. Uh, you will see, and I've actually seen some um, case reports of immune deficiency relating to lack of TLR3 or mutations in TLR3 genes. And so it goes to show that, like with the rest of a lot of these other monogenetic immune deficiencies, uh, there can be just one particular TLR receptor uh, that's knocked out, and then you get a very specific disease phenotype. And I can imagine with all the rest of these TLR receptors, there's going to be probably things that come out as we can identify each one of them. Uh, TLR7 and 8 are also in the endosome. They do viral single-stranded RNA. And then number 9 does these CPG motifs that I was talking about before. So again, these endosomal uh, TLR receptors, you've got to get inside, deep inside the cell, and they go through a separate pathway to get to the nucleus. So we've all heard about the hygiene hypothesis. And this came out in 1989 in the BMJ. Uh, Strachan described hay fever, hygiene, and household size. And he found that hay fever and eczema were less common in kids who came from larger families. And so he hypothesized that exposure to more infections, in other words, having more siblings, uh, was protective against having these conditions, hay fever um, and eczema. We've all sort of learned this hypothesis now to mean that our lives are too clean, and for some reason this has been associated, or maybe it's causal, in the fact that we have excessive or increasing atopic disease and autoimmunity. One of the questions that comes along with this, though, is you know, which microbes are the ones that make a difference? Which ones do you have to be infected with <coughs> in order to get the protective effect? And then what's the dose? You know, how often do you have to be uh, exposed, and when, and where, what age? So I think of ourselves as guests in a microbial world. And really, throughout most of human history, or all of human history, really, we've had very important roles between our bodies and then the things that grow on and in us. Um, Keeping in mind, too, that you know, for most of human history, uh, virtually all, really, infection has been the most important driver uh, in terms of human health. So we're most likely going to die of infection until maybe 100 years ago. Um, and so nowadays, in the modern world, we've got things like you know, antibiotics, vaccinations, and other hygiene, really, that sort of helps tip the scale in favor against uh, infection. And so the question, then, is, is this increased prevalence in atopic and autoimmune disease having to do with the fact that we're no longer infected or not uh, occupied by as many microbiota? Now, correlated to this idea is that we know children are born with immature immune systems, and it takes time for them to develop. And one of the questions is, what's the relationship between kids, their immune systems, and then the microbiota they grow up around in their guts, their noses, and their lungs, and other places, and also just the number of infections they get? So, is the uh, presence of, for example, parasites or bacteria required for the immune system to actually develop normally? And then an example of, say, food allergy, you have all this gut mucosa whose job is to sample the outside world and detect what's self, what's familiar, and what's pathogenic. And um, of course, if you have an inappropriate response, if the immune system learns incorrectly or doesn't learn at all, then you have this allergic response or autoimmune response. You know, patients ask about this a lot of, all the time, and I say things like, you know, look at babies, they're always putting things inside their mouth. And the way I see it is they're actually kind of grabbing something and saying, hey, look, immune system, this is the outside world, like, we're going to sample all this and show you, we're going to educate you about what's out here. Because the way I see it, if it was really a bad idea for babies to put things in their mouths, we wouldn't be here now. Yeah, so, but, you know, uh, the original thought here was you shifted TH2, TH1 balance, and that bit of a problem if you think that allergic diseases are TH2 driven, autoimmune or TH1 driven, why do we have an increased prevalence of both of them if this hypothesis is valid? Well, we're going to get into this, but 
There's not a lot written and understood about the way our bodies respond, like say, for example, to uh, parasites. And so there's both Th1 and Th2 in that response. And so the question is like a yin and yang, which direction does it go under which circumstances? So which bacteria, which, which parasites? And I don't think it's a very clear answer, to be honest. So stay tuned. I have a quick uh, sure. comment, I guess. Um, so Dr. Lemansky's talk at the Northwest Allergy Forum talked about rhinovirus infections increasing the risk of wheezing and asthma. So it seems contradictory to the hygiene hypothesis where if you're in a larger household and there's a lot of respiratory infections and all the sibs are sharing with one another, but yet they don't have as much asthma in those families. Right, so the question is, you know, what about the viruses, you know? And I think this kind of gets into the core of the question is which organisms matter in which ways. And we're actually going to talk about bacteria and, and uh, asthma here in a minute. How, how soon after birth is a baby's gut colonized with organisms? I think we don't know yet. I think oh, I think probably within minutes. I would have to guess. I mean, I'm sure as soon as it starts swallowing the things from the outside world, they're going to start you know, colonizing. The question is, which things will they colonize, and from whom, and under what circumstances? And some of ask these kinds of questions. And there's a study I'll talk about in a minute where they look at. Hey, you're a vaginal birth. Are you a vaginal birth at home? Are you one at a hospital? And how does it make a difference? Stress yeah. C-section. So um, you're all familiar with a lot of the observational studies that come out with the hygiene hypothesis, and there's a lot of them. So a lot of the questions they ask are, where are you born? How are you born? Um, did you grow up on a farm or not? It's kind of a fixation with this sort of idea like European farmhouse, barn situation. And then now there's more of this idea of what are your microbial or microbiota uh, influences as you're growing up. With a, the working hypothesis is that it's better or protective to be from a rural area or from the developing world. So again, I'm just going to sort of do a survey of some of these uh, the more recent uh, papers. So, and uh, the study from last year, they looked at birth location, the way that you were born, the bugs inside your GI tract, and then your relationship with eczema or atopy later. And <clears throat> so they captured one month olds, and they <laughs> they took their stool and used PCR, and they accounted for how many different kinds of bacteria there were growing in there, and they followed them up until age six or seven, and near the end of the study, they looked at the specific IgE to some particular foods. And actually, uh, Fatima presented this slide a couple weeks ago. And it's interesting that this sort of applies here and there. So what happened, though, is that they found babies who were colonized by C. difficile had <clears throat> increased wheezing, eczema, and food sensitization during those first six or seven years of life when they followed them. So it was actually worse to have had the, um, the C. difficile. Another outcome in the study, they found that a vaginal home birth was actually uh, protective, whereas a hospital vaginal birth wasn't. And again, this is very observational, but one can speculate and make arguments that the home environment is more replete with friendlier enterotype bacteria. You know, you can really make a lot of press releases here. But uh, the point is we're not exactly sure why. These are just associations, not necessarily implying causation. Another interesting study from last year looked at uh, birthplace and atopic sensitization. And in a nutshell, it was protective to have been born. So this is looking at uh, immigrant families. It was protective to have been born outside of the U.S. compared to, say, being born in the U.S. Among that cohort, though, that were born outside of the U.S., it was better to have spent your first two years of life in your home country, in the developing world. The idea being, well, the, the hypothesis being that during those first two years of life, being exposed to bacteria, parasites, or whatever, was helping develop the immune system in a non-allergic or non-atopic way. But what's interesting is they looked at the kids who were born, first generation born to immigrant families, and they had actually higher rates than anyone in the, uh, the study. And so uh, there's something maybe intrinsic about those people that's being turned off, I wonder, while they're in their home country and then being exposed to a Western microbiota profile, diet, et cetera, uh, turns on those genes and they tend to, or I should say turn on the genes, but it makes them more uh, likely to have atopic disease. Uh, earlier this year, there was this, uh, actually it wasn't even a paper, it was just a, a letter to the editor of JCI, and uh, looking at Amish children in northern Indiana and the prevalence of allergic sensitization. They were going off some 
well, a lot of stuff looking in the past here about uh, Swiss kids and farmhouses, you know, these houses that are attached to the barn. And this was a, uh, a survey study. It took kids uh, ages 6 to 12 uh, in Amish communities in Indiana, in Swiss farms, and Swiss kids who didn't grow up on a farm. And uh, looking at reports of self-reported animal exposure, raw milk exposure, size of your family, and then whether or not you have asthma, eczema, et cetera. Uh, sent out a lot of uh, surveys to Switzerland, and then only 85 to the Amish. And um, they went then and later uh, did skin and blood testing looking at um, allergic sensitization. And the nutshell here, and they like to tout these data, are that in terms of asthma, the Amish kids and Swiss farm kids had a lot less than the non-farm kids, again, self-reported. And then allergic sensitization, uh, dramatic changes between the Amish, uh, even the Swiss farm kids had more aller allergies, and then the non-farm Swiss kid had, kids had the, by far the largest rates of allergic sensitization. And of course, they came to the conclusion that farm exposures are protective in the development of allergies and asthma. But we've seen these data over and over again, um, and I almost feel like it's boring to talk about it. So what about uh, associations with atopic derm? And I'll touch on a couple studies here uh, from a couple years ago. Interesting that in this cohort, they looked at them until age 10, whether or not they had had wild-type varicella infection or just received the vaccine. And I thought it was impressive that they could find kids that had uh, varicella, wild-type varicella, because we've all had it, but most children now don't get varicella. In fact, I had to be, I was in Central America before I saw the first wild-type varicella case, or chickenpox, and I probably won't see it again you know, in the U.S., knock on wood. So anyway, uh, in these kids, they found that uh, if they had wild-type infection, they, uh, they had lower rates of eczema, it was delayed in how it was presented, and then it was less severe. But the kids who had the uh, vaccination uh, didn't actually have a protective effect. Um, and then a similar study in, um, actually this year, looking at kids who had eczema and then their associations with gut microbiota at age one month. And basically, if you had fewer or perhaps not enough uh, bacteria in your gut, you had more allergy-associated atopic dermatitis. So let's talk about early microbial exposures and asthma. And bottom actually kind of got the ball rolling here. So you know that rhinovirus is a problem, but what about the rest of it? So way before my time, there were theories about asthma inception. Maybe this was a kind of bacterial allergy. Uh, maybe it was due to infection with things like <laughs> strep pneumo, H flu. Uh, more recently, there has been some uh, work looking at uh, different bacteria like uh, chlamydia or mycoplasma pneumoniae and uh, associating that with asthma severity. Now, while they could correlate those with better or worse asthma, treating with antibiotics to presumably remove these bacteria didn't seem to make a difference. And so maybe it's not that big of a deal. When you look at uh, asthma patterns in kids, uh, you see these wheezing patterns most commonly in kids under four these transient wheezers who have these episodes up until age two or three. Then a large portion of these kids are these kind of remaining or chronic wheezers up until school age who have repeated episodes of air obstruction. Curiously, about half of that kid, those kids in my cohort, uh, have atopic sensitization to fluid or inhalants. And uh, frequently they have eosinophilic inflammation in the airway, which can be similar to some adults who have asthma. There are a lot of unknowns, though, about pediatric asthma inception. So, you know, what does it take to uh, put them into remission? What are some of the underlying mechanisms? Like some interesting observations, excuse me, <coughs> that you have, uh, you can have neutrophilic inflammation in some kids who have severe wheezing episodes, uh, as opposed to having, say, for example, eosinophils or macrophages, you have these neutrophilic uh, inflammation uh, phenotypes. Uh, one question is in this group where this was looked at, is this characteristic of that group? Or is it actually part of uh, early asthma? Is it actually intrinsic to the disease? And interestingly, as we know, we can see neutrophilic inflammation in adults who have viral infections uh, relating to severe asthma. Now, uh, viruses are a common trigger of, of wheeze, as Dr. Lemansky said. And uh, I think we already know the answer to these questions. Do viruses cause airway inflammation? Yes, they can. Is it always neutrophilic? Maybe, maybe not. And then uh, do viruses contribute to asthma prior to school age? Definitely. And we know it's rhinovirus. So going along these lines, uh, Hans Biscard in uh, Copenhagen uh, published a study a few years ago asking the question, what about bacteria? What does bacterial colonization have to do with um, 
asthma inception. And so this is a Danish birth cohort. They actually pulled them out of their larger study there. And they had 321 kids that started the study. And these were all kids who had a positive asthma predictive index. So they were pulled out of households where moms at least had asthma. And um, they, <laughs> they were sedated at one month of age. I think that's part of the overall study that they were sedated for some sort of lung function test. And so they took a soft catheter in these sedated babies, went to the hypopharynx, aspirated, and then cultured, looking specifically for uh, pneumococcus, H. flu, MCAT, and Staph aureus. They brought them back in um, at 12 months of age, or in other words, a year, and they re-aspirated, re-cultured, sort of characterized what things looked like then. They excluded uh, premature babies uh, and kids who had a lot of lung problems. So they followed this cohort from birth to age five. They had daily symptom reporting uh, in terms of wheezing or even whistling sounds, breathlessness, cough. They came in every six months for uh, checkups, exams, and if there were any acute episodes, they brought them in acutely into the uh, study center for evaluation. So in terms of the primary endpoints in the study, we looked at wheezing episodes. So a wheezing episode is three days of wheeze, primarily by the diary card, not necessarily because they came in. Primary wheeze, I'm sorry, persistent wheeze, you could either do this with five wheeze episodes in a month, or daily symptoms for a full uh, month. Or I'm sorry, five wheeze episodes, six months, or uh, four consecutive weeks of wheezing. So acute severe exacerbations were defined as the diagnosis of the exacerbation plus needing to have had a high dose of oral steroids. That could have been in their research center or in an ED. And then at the age of five, they then made the diagnosis of asthma or not based on GINA criteria. Some other measures they looked at, airway resistance. Uh, they looked at some blood markers, so eosinophil counts, total serum IgE, and then specific IgE to food and inhalants. Uh, just an FYI, they used a 0.35 cutoff as binary, so that you had it or you didn't with specific IgE. So I was curious, uh, in terms of the treatments, they used terbutaline and MDI as their PRN med in the study. And then if they had any persistent wheeze problems, they were allowed to be treated like a normal kid would. And this is their regimen. They used budesonide uh, daily for three months if they had had persistent wheeze episodes. If that didn't work, they extended it to six or then maybe 12 months. And then they used monolucast as an add-on therapy for treatment failures. In the case of acute severe, ex severe exacerbations, they used a uh, much higher dose of budesonide uh, once a day for two weeks, and they had the option of adding prednisone, so pretty standard stuff. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide for now. So again, the question is, what's the relationship between neonatal bacterial colonization and asthma later? So thinking of these kids who had this aspirate of the hypopharynx at age one month, 21% of them were colonized by one or more of these bacteria. By far and large, Staph aureus was the most common. Uh, strep pneumo, uh, H. flu, and MCAT were down to the 10% or lower range. Again, these were asymptomatic colonized children. They never got treated specifically for this problem. Um, they were able to correlate a higher colonization in kids who had more siblings at home. Um, and then these, uh, this colonization was independent of the factors like gender, uh, breastfeeding status, smoking, etc. So they found that um, based, up the, based on the colonization rates at one month of age, there were significant, statistically significant, uh, higher increases or higher rates of persistent wheeze. Uh, that was the first end point. Next was acute severe exacerbations for wheeze. Those were higher, and then hospitalizations for wheeze. And I'm not very good at explaining statistics, but in terms of a hazard ratio, I believe what this means is that you were two, almost two and a half times more likely to have persistent wheeze episode because you were colonized uh, at one month of age. So actually, we're trying to extrapolate now what happens. You're colonized young, and then uh, what happens up until age five. Uh, some other things, they found that uh, bloody eosinophils and total serum IgE were elevated, uh, correlating back to this uh, first month of life. And then asthma prevalence was higher. When they made that diagnosis at age five, um, they saw more of it in the kids who uh, had been colonized. Interesting, uh, specific IgE, when they drew it at four years, that was their checkpoint during the study, wasn't affected. So these kids didn't have any change in their at least serum sensitization to foods or inhalants. The conclusions were that neonatal colonization, I would say asymptomatic neonatal colonization by hypopharyngeal bugs or a combination of these is a significant predictor of asthma, reversible airway obstruction, blood eosinophil count, and total IgE. 
Very interesting, though, the 12-month colonization rate was not predictive. In other words, it mattered what they were colonizing with at one month of age, but not when they were a year of age. And so they looked kind of more closely, and the Staph aureus almost fell out completely. Whereas before, it was really kind of the most important bug. It, it was just kind of a few here and there. And it changed more to Streptomyelo, MCAT, and H. flu, which we all know are probably the ones we think about the most in terms of infection. So when you think about the study, you know, is he is Visgard pointing out a correlational relationship or is it causal? We don't know exactly. Um, think about it mechan mechanistically with respect to the innate immune system. Uh, we know that um, kids who are born to atopic moms, in other words, kids are kind of in that as a predictive index zone, uh, tend to have poor uh, T regulatory function. So they have a little bit less ability to downregulate immune responses. Uh, they also can have impaired Th1 responses. Think about Th1, these, these pro-inflammatory pro responses. So these kids really can't manage the number, theoretically can't manage the number of bacteria that are in their body and that may then put them at risk for uh, problems down the road. Uh, does neonatal carriage indicate defective clearing? So when you look at all babies, uh, there's a lot of bugs. So 50% have some, and you look in the general population, 50% will have some form of carriage on one of these pathogenic bacteria whereas adults don't have them nearly as often. And the question is, is there something about this developing immune system that puts them at higher risk in general? Um, good time. I think I'm going to skip this slide, but this is basically looking at um, the relationship between, between Th1 uh, innate responses and telic receptor 2. The thought being is that if you have variations in telic receptor 2, this may explain why some kids need high levels of exposure versus low levels of exposure uh, in order to get the protective effect. So kind of getting down to the receptor level uh, and trying to explain the hygiene hypothesis. Okay, so what do we know so far? Uh, the hygiene hypothesis has been out there for quite a while. There's a lot of supporting observational studies. The idea that you get less atopy and autoimmune disease from being raised in a farm, the way you're born, uh, when you move to the United States. And we know that the innate immune system has a role here. Uh, and more recently, though, now we're thinking about the immune, uh, for the biome part of the, uh, the immune system, uh, where the, the biome interacts with the immune system as it develops. So what about microbial treatments? Can we use this hypothesis to our advantage? And so let's look at some animal models of this hypothesis. Uh, these were some animal models looking at um, mice that were <coughs> infected with uh, helminth parasites <coughs> or not. And so they used H. polygyrus, T. murus, and N. brasiliensis. And essentially, in these various uh, studies, I distilled them down into some bullet points here. Uh, in the first group, there was decreased allergic and autoimmune phenotypes when infected by the parasites. So you take these mirroring models of allergy and uh, autoimmune disease. You take half those mice, you give them parasites, the rest you don't, and you sort of see how it falls out. So you saw less asthma. You saw, even in a peanut allergy model, uh, these mice, they couldn't actually elicit anaphylaxis in, in mice that really should have had anaphylaxis while they were infected with the uh, parasites. And when they looked at specific IgE, they couldn't get quite as high of numbers. So the thought here in this observational, well, it's actually this an intervention study, but looking at this, the thought was that, well, maybe there's something about these, these helmets. Maybe they're doing something to protect the, the mice. So let's do a little bit of a talk about helminth worms. Uh, these are intestinal parasites. Uh, come in four major classes. We're all familiar with the way they're uh, transmitted, usually through poor hygiene. And I thought it was very fascinating. So a quarter of the world's population is infected with intestinal worms right now. So there's one and a half billion people with round worms, uh, like Ascaris, you know, and, and that's a lot of people. Uh, hookworms and whipworms are really close behind. So a very, very common human problem. And you know, if you went back 100 years, it's probably, I don't know, what, 50%? It's hard to say, but very common. These are three most common uh, organisms, so Ascaris. Uh, as you know, you know, eat substances that have the eggs, they grow, or hatch and then grow in our intestines. And unfortunately, Ascaris can just keep shedding eggs, and so this can be a lifelong friend. Uh, then whipworms and hookworms are very similar. Uh, hookworms, as you know, can go into the lung, the side just being inside the gut. Now, a lot of these can be asymptomatic infections. Now, of course, they're gonna be shedding uh, eggs and, and stool, but uh, you may not actually feel it in the short term. 
But of course, there are a lot of deleterious health effects. So you get anemia, malnutrition, and all kinds of problems. So it is a problem to have a helminth infection too. As we're going to talk about, you know, what if we start using these to treat people? So I didn't think there's a lot written about when I went back and researched this. You know, how does the body, how does the immune system rather process helminth infection? And you've got to think about this. This is a large organism. I mean, an Ascaris runner was going to be this big or longer. And you know, our immune system is de this, uh, designed, especially the adaptive immune system, to take in a little bit of little bitty microbes, process them, chew them up, put them on MHC, and you know, and make a response. These guys are huge. And as a rule, I, I sort of get this impression that the immune system tolerates having parasites around. I think it's sort of a, this is my opinion. I think it kind of learned that. These are too big to get rid of, and if we were used to use this TH1 style response, this pro-inflammatory response, you're just going to nuke the whole system, and we're all going to be sick and die. Um, so there's this idea of a gentle TH2 response, where you sort of encourage the parasite to leave uh, with macrophages, macrophages, eosinophils, and IgE. And um, the whole idea is that with this gentle uh, TH2 cell response, it can suppress TH1, so you have more Treg cells. Kind of like we talk about you know, immunotherapy, you've got this IL-10 response that kind of calms down the rest of this whole process. And so this less reactionary picture, maybe it's sort of a, a way of coexisting, not necessarily fighting off the, the parasites, but sort of accepting that they're there. Um, but of course, there could be a TH1 response too uh, from various um, pathogens. So we don't know which ones are the ones that cause TH1, which ones cause TH2, and, and, and back and forth. And so patients often ask about this, you know, why do we have the hygiene hypothesis? And I say, well, look, you know, are our parasites really meant to be there? Are they part of our immune system, you know, designed to constantly have them there and deal with them? And, you know, I, I say, I use the, the border collie example. It's, it's very smart, but when it's bored, it gets into trouble. And so maybe the immune system is in this sort of frame of mind when we have uh, increased allergy and autoimmunity. So are helminths helpful? So, and the other question is, do they have a positive immunomodulatory effects? So in classic parasitism, you're talking about a non-mutual relationship. So the guest is kind of overstaying their welcome. And the question, though, is, is the host actually benefiting, too? And you might think that in the case of helminths, maybe we're getting something out of this relationship, too. And more importantly, is there something in the immune system that's actually benefiting from this, this sort of mutual relationship? So back in the early 2000s, the first studies using T. suis uh, were seeing that uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease was rare, again, observational. Uh, there are rare diseases in areas where there are persistent parasitic infection. And the thought was, well, let's assume that it's beneficial, it's protective, and can we actually treat people uh, to try to reduce the rates of these diseases without causing an invasive helminthic infection, because that's that, right? So, um, borrowing from these observational studies, we'll talk about some interventional studies here in a minute. Um, this was taking kids in the developing world, so the first was in Vietnam, uh, and it was later confirmed in Venezuela and Gabon, where they took kids who just at baseline uh, had parasitic infection. They gave them anti helminthic tra treatment, uh, usually albendazole and mebendazole, and then captured them several months later. So, in the uh, Vietnamese study, they waited nine months after treatment, and they found that there was increased skin positivity to uh, inhalants or foods. And uh, interesting that there was not an effect in clinical uh, phenotypes, so wheezing, rhinitis, exercise induced bronchospasm. And the thought was that by removing the parasites, which were really a baseline part of their bodies and their, their physiology, that they became more allergic, so to speak. They didn't go all the way and develop you know, a phenotype of asthma or allergies, but really, only nine months is not a long time uh, for an intervention time. Now, of course, there's always a yin and yang with this, so studying Ecuador uh, didn't seem to serve that effect, but three out of four did in this case. Here's a meta-analysis looking at the same idea, showing that there's an inverse relationship between allergy and the presence of either current or past helminth infection. But there's probably something to this. Um, they found that current parasitic inf infection is significantly associated with reduced risk of skin sensitization to aero allergens. So, Perhaps being infected right now is more important than being infected at some point in your life, uh, which we kind of saw on that last slide. Again, these studies are based mostly on skin testing and blood testing and not on the idea of clinical allergy 
uh, which we do every day. The question is, is it time to start treating with helmets? It may seem like a radical idea, you know, 50 years ago. It's not a new idea, though. I first saw this slide. I think it's interesting. Uh, our uh, infectious disease professor in, in med school showed this. I think it's real. And I'm trying to... I, I think this is probably, what, 1910-ish or 1900? And so I'll, I'll read it to everyone. read it all. It says, no diet, no baths, no exercise. Bath, the enemy that's, the enemy that's shortening your life vanished. How? With sanitized tapeworms. Friends for a fair form. Easy to swallow. That's good. Um, but I think people who were eating these didn't realize these were probably tenuous solium. <laughs> and they're coming from a pig reservoir. Um, and if they saw the micrograph of the little like latch-on part of the head, they would be even more scared. But I should have captured this, and maybe it's helping your immune system, too. Immune boost. So we're going to get to some studies looking at this Trichura suis, or a, a pig whipworm. And these guys uh, really only infect pigs with respect to you know, our, our purposes. Uh, the pigs eat the, uh, the, the ova, they hatch and develop in their bodies, and they pass them out and they kind of just repeat the cycle. Um, interesting point, though, is these are not pathogenic to humans. So if you happen to be at a farm and it happened to consume a T. suis ovum, uh, you're probably not going to get infected. It'll probably pass through your body. Um, so that's important to remember. So Summers got real busy with this in the early 2000s, and he wanted to establish safety with consuming these uh, T. suis ova, or the TSO. He grabbed uh, patients with IBD, and he gave them just one dose. And in this case, somebody gathered 2,500 T. suis ova. So they got the pig feces, and they grabbed the eggs, and they put them in a capsule. And in these, uh, I guess, seven patients, they gave them just one dose. Follow, and we'll talk about that. Then later he got more bold and he did 29 patients with Crohn's disease. At this time he started to kind of develop a regimen. So now it was these 2,500 ova in a capsule every three weeks for 24 weeks. And then later he did uh, 54 patients also with ulcerative colitis. Um, and then he did this what? Uh, he randomized it to placebo or not, did every other week for 12 weeks. So he was really proud of himself. He said there was no adverse events in all three studies. Um, he said there was rare, rare helminthic infection when they went in on the colonoscopy. They, they said they found a few little squigglies here and there, but by far and large, they weren't able to see them in most patients. And uh, they didn't capture any in the, or the stool, no ovid parasites in the stool. So at least maybe it's safe. Um, and then in terms of clinical success, there were varied reports. Uh, I think there's also kind of a sort of a patient bias in favor of this because you know, they want to feel better. How did they know that they actually survived after being given that, I mean, that parasite survived? Might have, they didn't see it in OMP and they didn't well, see it. Well, they saw a few actually in the colonoscopy. Uh, they, 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 they really downplayed, you know, only a few patients and we only saw a couple you know, worms inside the intestines. You would think you'd have to actually have clinical infection though to trigger your immune right. system to be beneficial. You just pass through benignly, you wouldn't accomplish anything. Well, was the over trigger? Yeah, so this seems to be an effect though, that's what we're talking about next. So in 2010, this came out in JCI, and this is actually a prospective double blinded control study looking at uh, these T. suis ova as a treatment for allergic rhinitis. Uh, and so they did, also in Denmark, surprisingly. Uh, they took 100 patients. These were only adults who only had grass uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis. They randomized them to eight doses of these, these tablets or these capsules of eggs uh, or placebo. And they, they did it sort of wrapping them up into the grass pollen season. So over the course of three weeks in the early spring, they gave them these doses, these eight doses, and they watched them through the fall into October. And their main outcomes were uh, allergic rhinitis symptom scores and the number of well days during the pollen season itself. I'm going to skip this guy. So I think it's very important to talk about the adverse events when you're consuming parasite eggs. Uh, so i love to know the conversation went. You know, I, did they explain to patients that this was a parasite maybe that they're taking? And obviously there could be a sugar pill, but I like to show those parasites too. So there are a lot of GI complaints. Uh, there are three-fourths in the, uh, the treatment group and still half in the, the placebo group. So there must have been something going on in the minds of the placebo group even that they kind of over-reported the number of symptoms. Um, 
Uh, diarrhea was common in both groups. In fact, it wasn't different between them. Um, if you're interested, the peak diarrhea was at 41 days. There was a lot of upper abdominal pain and flatulence, uh, but there were no hospitalizations due to adverse events. And I'm not sure if they actually went in and did colonoscopy in these groups because this is just larger carinitis. But I'd be curious to know if there were parasites in the stool, if they were in the, the colon. So when they compared the placebo group and the uh, treatment group, there were significant differences in uh, diarrhea, uh, the transient style diarrhea, uh, peripheral eosinophilia, and then some very specific uh, immune globulins. So up here you have, in red, the t suis treatment group had higher levels of IgG. Maybe they were allergic. Uh -huh. uh, or uh, you saw increases in IgG4, IgE. And they, they taught it, look, you know, you've, you've successfully induced this immune uh, profile. You know, somebody who has a helmet infection, uh, you've changed their immune system almost in the direction of, like, say, immunotherapy. Uh, you've got increased IL-10, TGF-beta, um, but you haven't infected them, I would say, in parentheses, but there seem to be some side effects. But the bottom line is they didn't help anybody with their allergic rhinitis. So their uh, symptom scores, a number of well days, weren't affected at all. Um, and then it looked at their testing, uh, grass specific IgE, and then skin testing, no differences. The thing about the studies really is they gave them eight tablets of these parasite eggs in the early spring, and then they wanted to change all of the immunotherapy, or I say, change all of their allergic phenotype. And so it's not a surprise in my mind that they could somehow make some changes in the immune profile, but not really remove the disease or make a big impact. Let's look at our current therapy. If you do um, allergic rhinitis treatment with immunotherapy, you know, you're going to not see a pretty big difference you know, in these first few months right after starting. So I think you got to hand it to them for at least showing you can create a change in the immune profile, but not necessarily changing the disease course. So what about you know, this therapy? Uh, do you need to do it longer? Uh, do you need to start earlier in the season? Do you need to start earlier in life? Like say maybe children to make an impact. Um, does it take live elements? In other words, are you actually getting a, a benefit from just the eggs, or maybe just their bacterial products or you, you products? Recall that the immunologist in the United Kingdom who did hookworm yeah, self-infection, yeah. and that seemed to work for him. But that's yeah. the only. Is there any follow-up on that? Any follow-up on that? I didn't say any catch any of Can't you buy hookworm eggs from Mexico and? <laughs> they advertised as a treatment. For he actually worked in the heat. He didn't infect it. He used to go barefoot in places. Right. I thought he scarified his arm and self infected her. But and it, that was actually pretty hot data 15 years ago. Yeah. Fecal therapy guy. But it's not, it's not there on the internet. No hook on him anymore. So, uh, I think we're running out of time, but I'll zoom for the rest of this. So, there are other helmets we could look at, uh, but these are also pathogenic to humans. So, we could use hookworms, uh, Trichuris, Trichiura. There are some case reports, but I think these are very enthusiastic, self volunteered people who are doing these studies. Um, there's also this ES62, which is a glycoprotein that's coming out of uh, nematodes. And curiously, it stimulates TLR4, which is the same one that uses uh, lipopolysaccharide, or detects poly lipopolysaccharide. And so there's just something in this, I think, that we'll, we'll probably find out more about later. But maybe you can use these uh, helminth products as opposed to just the whole live organism, decrease the side effect rate, decrease the risk for infection. And then a lot of studies can be done based on this. But first, they need to optimize the treatment schedule, which organisms, and which part of the organism. Well, it would be helpful to have a biomarker to say, hey, these people will respond to this and these won't. And I can't help but wonder if these, like, say, gut enterotypes will be a biomarker uh, to know whether. Uh, Enterotype A responds well to nematode B, or you know, and so on. So, in summary, uh, microbiomes, microbial products, and innate immunity um, have been interlinked for a long time. The hygiene hypothesis uh, states that, uh, you know, well, suggests that you know, being in a rural environment is better. Um, but I would add that there's probably more to it than just that. There's probably these interactions between the immune system and the microbiome, and that I think based on what I've seen and the way direction things are going in the future, uh, you may see more helminth based treatments, uh, which sort of stands to reason because maybe there is something in this where they can help modulate the immune system and make it a more, or else a less reactionary response to uh, outside uh, factors. This is interesting, I, read, I picked up my uh, JACI yesterday, and there are no hypoallergenic dogs. We have evidence now. <laughs> they looked at these lab poodles, poodles, Spanish water dogs, is it this Airedale here? 
And uh, they actually have more can F1 than, <laughs> than the mutts. So anyway, I also learned uh, researching that kids like dirt. Uh, if you do any ser image searches for hygiene hypothesis, it stuff comes up first. So anyway, thank you. Oh, yeah. Allergic sensitization in 44 percent, mm -hmm. which is about twice what we usually think of as being you know, the normal population. Any explanation? Sorry. Any explanation to that? No, I mean keep in mind this is an observational study where they handed out uh, self-reported questionnaires. Sure. But if that's true, we should all move to Switzerland. Yeah. 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 Well, in that same Amish study, you said um, it increased the risk for allergy and asthma, but did they do any clinical analysis other than, I know you said the serum IgE was just positive, but was there any clinical data? No, there were no clinical data because they couldn't, it was, again, it's a survey, so they couldn't bring them in and do any kind of measurements. So it really just, again, another observational study. I use an example of another observational study of hygiene hypothesis. Okay. And then I could have gone on all day, you know, reviewing that literature. I sort of have two questions about um, parasites. Has anybody ever gone retrospectively from an ID clinic and look at all the people that have been infected with parasites and go back and ask them, do they have atopic disease or do they ever have asthma or allergies? Number one. And number two, these people often have really high IgEs, but they end up not being allergic to any of the common allergens. So has anybody just taken parasite-infected people as just a case control study to ask what happened to them? I didn't see any of those studies. Um, you know, but if you capture the parasite infected patients in an ID clinic, you're going to get a lot of foreign people, I imagine. And, you know, like, say, at, at Harborview, you're going to get a lot of exotic infections. Uh, and I'm wondering how that might skew the results. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. It might remain as a thought experiment, though, unfortunately. Uh, Kevin, I've, is there hard data? I've always assumed that people naturally infected with illness living in. Asia or Africa have a lower prevalence of atopic disease. Just the point, if the immune system is bored and doesn't have helmets to deal with, you become atopic. Is that actually factually known? I mean, that's the attempt in all these studies to try to, I mean, it's a hypothesis. How do you prove a hypothesis, you know? Uh, so the question is, you know, can we reassure ourselves or maybe show by treating, what I'm trying to say, uh, I don't think we know. I think that we're just trying to use a positive study where we, you know, we use the intervention to remove the disease. And I guess that's the way we can prove it to ourselves. Well, I mean, any of the opposite, just mm -hmm. gone to a, an African country and skin test people to common aeroallergens and do surveys of the prevalence of asthma and rhinitis. And just said it's low. I, I think those data are out there, though. You know, anecdotally, I remember we used to have a Harborview clinic decades ago. We would always, at the end of the Vietnam War, we had a tremendous influx of people here from Southeast Asia. We had people who came here as adults and said they never had any of these respiratory allergic symptoms until they moved here. And I always thought it was just societal that, you know, when you barely were alive and you were living in a war zone, you didn't complain about having hay fever. <laughs> you got to this society, all of a sudden you realize that that was acceptable to complain of those symptoms. But there's clearly more to it than that. Something changed immunologically in these people, even though they were adults. Um, and I don't know if it was ever well explained. We never knew whether these people were infected with helmets, and they, to my knowledge, you know, didn't get treated for them when they came here. But somehow that plays into this story. You think about the Japanese studies that show gastric cancer significant increase as soon as they moved to the United States. So it's something in our environment. Something that changed. The, the Queen of Fish started eating McDonald's. Well, the Japanese studies show that the gastric cancer rates in people who moved from Japan to the U.S. actually over time declined to U.S. levels. But if they stay in Japan, it's far, I don't know the numbers, but it's far greater incidence. I've read those studies. Gene and environment interactions. It's yeah. nitrate. <laughs> it's nitrate. You know, it sounds like you have to have an invasive parasite, and this is right. the you know, ones they're using aren't invasive. Do they look at eosinophil counts to you know, support an invasive parasite infection in these Swiss? They, they look at a serologic response. Yeah, the yeah, but no, I, I, I mean invasive. 
I'm not looking at. I mean, I'm not looking I'm at. Guys, I'm talking about. Oh, well, do they? Do you mm -hmm. see a centerfields or? Well, you'd have to get, you'd have to go through the literature to find a study where they actually did serum samples on in country you know, versus here. Uh, I'm sure that's out there. I have to go look again. It makes sense though. I think he's got the base. Are there, are there other studies where people are looking at components? You mentioned the one glycoprotein, but it seems obvious if you have a dangerous organism <clears throat> that maybe there's just a few molecules out of it that are going to really help you. Right, so they're, they're looking Without at like, risk, so. like polygyrus and different kinds of nematodes and saying like, are there intrinsic chemicals or excreted products that we can use instead of, in other words, can we just tickle TLR4 uh, you know, or one of the, the TLR receptors or some part of the immune system with, with just a single product and get the same effect? Yeah, like the idea of a vaccine. Yeah. Right, right. exactly. So it would be like a parasitic, but it would be, it'd be through the GI tract. You really would want to get it. That's how the body recognizes parasites. I mean, it kind of gets back to like why food allergy sensitization needs probably to be through the mouth as opposed to an injection form. So, yeah, I think it's very fascinating. I actually, I didn't expect to find as much on this. I thought it was all kind of observational stuff. And, but I noticed the t sua study, um, I guess, several months ago. I came across my desk in JACI. If you look at um, immigrants that come to our country and sort of move into our culture, the common theory is that they become allergic at our levels instead of their previous levels. But has anybody looked at family of these people who come in and never goes through parasite therapy? Because they're probably all infected with parasites when they get here. That's a good question. Is so you see a lot of, I don't know in Seattle, but I'm assuming it's the same. You see these families of 10 or 12 people living in a house, only one of them speaks English. So I would imagine half of them never really got medical care either. That's a good question. Yeah, music. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's so easy to treat, too. That's the, the ironic part about it. You know, just a single treatment, usually. You the Senate to get your ivy neck in. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>